First of all, let me in, uh, introduce ourselves. Ilka Taipala is, is the chair, and I'm the vice chair of uh, Leo Mekelin Foundation. Uh, we feel very, very honored to have you here in Helsinki. Uh, your both books, which you have uh, written with your colleague, uh, uh, Doran Asemoglu. <laughs> uh, difficult names for a thin. Uh, they have been a great success, in, in, especially in, in, in social science circles in, in, in Finland. And, and, and they both, and, and, and these books, um, uh, Why Nations Fail, and, and, and the narrow corridor, they have also been translated into, into Finnish, which is very, very, which is very, very good indeed. Uh, I cannot uh, think of a better person uh, to be invited to, to, this, to this occasion uh, for uh, giving you a little memory. Uh, I would like to to, to uh, extend to you a, 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 a little medal. Uh, it is um, uh, uh, the head of of of, uh, uh, of Leo Michelin. Uh, it is a work by a very <clears throat> very famous Finnish sculpture. Uh, his, his name is Ville Valgren. And, 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 and the medal was, uh, was made for, for the 60th birthday of Leo Michelin. So quite many years ago, <laughs> um, um, the medal uh, is, is in, 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 uh, has been given in very many forms. There is a golden one also. This is not, not gold, but that, that it is. <laughs> uh, just to remind you of, uh, and, and, and that uh, our thanks to you for, for coming here. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that uh, extremely generous introduction. I kept wondering, who was she talking about again? Uh, so it's, uh, yeah. Um, okay, wonderful. Thank you. I'm very honored. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I think it's about the third or fourth time I've been in Finland, and it's just a fascinating country, so I'm, I'm honored and, and excited to be here. And, and, but you are absolutely right. And it was very interesting hearing people talk because uh, so many of the words came up uh, that have been central to my research for 30 years, like this word inclusion. I'm going to talk about inclusion. And the rule of law, uh, that's, that's been very central to my uh, thinking and my research over the past 30 years, on, mostly with Professor Ashimolu. As, 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 as you were saying. And I thought I'm going to start, I'm going to give a little talk. Um, I can see the slides, but you can't. Where are they? Uh? Ah, okay, great. Okay, oh, very clever, okay. And I'm going to start, I'm going to talk, and I'm putting up here something that I think Leo Mechelin, based on what I have read, would have appreciated which is the cover of the Ukrainian translation of uh, Why Nations Fail. So, so that's, uh, that's a struggle that he would have understood. It was a struggle that he took part in to establish the rule of law, to try to control uh, Russian uh, absolutism, and to fight for the independence of Finland. And that's a struggle that's going on right now as we talk in Ukraine. So I think that's a tribute to the Ukrainians. Uh, I've been in Ukraine and lectured, and um, I have very good friends there. So um, 
So, so I think he would have got that. And so, and I, and I just put it up there. Now, I, whenever I give talks, I have the Ukrainian cover up there as a sort of tribute to the struggle that's going on in the moment. So, I, when I was invited and I read a bit about Leah Michelin, I thought, okay, this is, this is a very appropriate thing and I'm honored and it fits right into my thinking. Okay, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about my kind of general theory of economic and political development as it's emerged over the years, and focus on the connection to the rule of law. And actually thinking through it, you know, what I want to say is that obviously the rule of law is a key part of what I would call inclusive institutions, but actually it's more than that, and that's, it's a tool. It's, it's a tool for creating an inclusive society in a very specific way that I'm, I want to talk about that perhaps I've never really understood before and Professor Ashimolu and I haven't really understood before. So, so it created, having to give this lecture created a kind of idea that I had never really coalesced before. So I think we'll probably write something on that. Okay, so, so, uh, so yeah, why nations fail? So let, let, let me start talking about, about the research and, and, and my research and, and, and the role of inclusion in economic success and the role of the rule of law in inclusion. And somebody said to me uh, recently, oh, but your, your book, Why Nations Fail, came out in 2012. You know, how could that possibly be relevant still? So I thought, you know, I'd, I'd just check what was happening in the Korean Peninsula at night. You know, this is one of the sort of motivating examples of the book. And in some sense, you know, you can see not much has changed in the Korean Peninsula at night. There it is in 2012. There it is in 2022, which is the most recent photograph I could find. And I like this photograph a lot uh, because in some sense you could explain all my ideas just from this one photograph. Uh, so there, there is the Korean Peninsula. You can see that the South, in South Korea, uh, that huge splash of light there is Seoul. Uh, there's a lot of light, light bulbs, electricity. You're going to see that electricity and light bulbs are going to be a theme, running theme in this talk. There's a lot of electricity and light bulbs and that's indicative, of course, of enormous differences in living standards, in economic development, uh, in life expectancy, which is about 10 years longer in the South Korea than it is in North Korea. So that it captures in a very visceral way enormous differences in economic prosperity with enormous consequences for people's lives. And the reason this example is nice is that it's obvious what the explanation for that is. It's obvious that that difference is caused by the different ways in which the economic institutions, I'm going to call, I'm going to use this word institutions, by which I mean, you know, the rules that we create to govern our society, to create incentives and patterns of opportunities, and of course the law is a key part of that set of institutions. It's obvious that the institutions, especially governing the economy in South Korea, are radically different from those in North Korea. That the institutions in South Korea create incentives and opportunities for people that create all the things that lead, that lead to all the things that economists know create prosperity. Investment, saving, innovation, entrepreneurship. That happens in South Korea because the incentives and opportunities are very different. In North Korea, you have this communist dictatorship. There's no markets, there's no opportunities, there's no incentives unless perhaps you're related uh, to the president. So, and that's the economic part of this. But it's also obvious that the reason the economies are organized differently in North and South Korea is because of politics. That's the political system in North Korea that creates the poverty. Okay? And it's a different political system in South Korea that's created these very different opportunities and very different patterns of economic development. So in some sense, why, the book Why Nations Fail is sort of saying, you know, if you look at the North and South Korea and you think about why South Korea is so much more successful economically than North Korea, then that's the story with all poor and rich countries. Okay. Basically, that's what the book is about. And it's not about capitalism and socialism also. 
it's about inclusion and what we call the opposite of inclusion, which is extractive institutions. So let me talk a bit more about light bulbs and inclusion, okay, because I want to dwell on this word inclusion. It came up, you know, a couple of times and I was very excited to, to hear that. So, so this is the patent of the light bulb uh, taken out by Thomas Edison in 1880, okay. So, so of course, you know, We've known in economics since the work of Robert Solow in the 1950s that what drives economic development is innovation. It's new technologies, new ways of raising human productivity. Think about the Industrial Revolution you know, that started in my own country, England, Britain, in the late 18th century. What was that? It was innovation. It was innovation in cotton industry and in spinning and weaving. It was new technologies, the railway, the steam engine. That's what generated the Industrial Revolution, that's what generated this enormous increase in prosperity, ultimately, that we've seen in the modern world. Okay? Uh, and where did those innovations come from? Okay? They came from people, from people's ideas, from people's creativity, from people's passions and energies and life projects. You know? And Edison was a very talented man, he was very creative, he was home, he wasn't educated, he was homeschooled, his father was a roofing contractor, but he was just a kind of brilliant man. And when he invented the light bulb, he took out a patent. And what did the patent, why did he do that? The patent protects your intellectual property rights. Okay, so you have an idea, you can benefit from that economically, but other people can copy the idea, and they can benefit from it. So this is a classic example uh, you know, studied by the economist Paul Romer, you know, for which he got the Nobel Prize of what, you know, he pointed out that innovation has this element of what economists would call, it's this sort of non-rivalrous, meaning I come up with an idea, you can use it, you can take it and use it, okay? So the consequence of that is if I'm innovating, crucial for prosperity, if I'm innovating, I create ideas, but other people can benefit from them. So the idea of a patent is to protect my intellectual property rights, to create incentives for me to innovate. Okay, so this is a key thing that created incentives for innovation. Okay. But who was it who took out these patents? Who was it that innovated in the late 19th century United States when it was becoming the kind of leading industrial country in the world? Well, that was studied, and that's one of the reasons I like this patent evidence so much, it was studied by the great economic historian Ken Sokolov. And what Ken showed is that somehow what you understand from Edison is, was the general picture, meaning if you ask the question, who were people who took out patents? What you find is they come from everywhere in society. They come poor people, rich people, artisans, elites, you know, non-educated people like Edison. That's not an argument for the absence of education. It's just a statement that talent, ideas, creativity, are spread out everywhere in society. And for me, the key thing about inclusion is you need to create a set of institutions in society that can harness all that latent talent in society, okay? You know, I work a lot in the developing world. I work a lot in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Nigeria. And if you ask me, you know, why is the Congo, in one sentence, the one sentence version of, you know, why is the Congo so poor, I'd say, Wasted talent, it's the two-word version. Wasted talent, you know, there's just wasted talent. There's just so many people with talent and creativity, and they're trapped. They're trapped without access to education. There's no roads without access to the rule of law and basic institutions that can empower them to do what humans do, to be creative, to create things. And that, that's why inclusion is so important. And here's an example of a very specific institution connected, of course, to the rule of law, which, which created that inclusion. Why is it connected to the rule of law? Well, it's one thing to pass a patent law, it's another thing to enforce it, okay? So this is intimately created to the rule of law. Okay, so let me just, to give you a cute example, let me just take a random example of an English family, since I'm an Englishman, and, and, and tell you what inclusive institutions did for them, all right? So I can go back to the 1841 census and uh, the family I'm going to talk about, the Cocos, uh, were, were fishermen in B. Sands. Okay, so B. Sands is in the southwest of England, 
Um, I'll, I'll show you a map. I don't want to insult your intelligence, but probably you may not know exactly where B Sands is. B Sands is right down here in Dorset in the southern England. And the Cokers, George Coker, was a fisherman. You can see a pretty impoverished fisherman in B Sands. He migrated up to the north of England and got a job in the cargo fleet's ironwork. So this was the Industrial Revolution. This was up in a place called South Bank, way up there on the River Tees in the northeast of England. Okay? So that was the first generation of the Cokers. What about the second generation? Well, his daughter uh, was born in Oxford Street in South Bank. That's what Oxford Street looks like today. It's a pretty, it's a pretty run-down part of uh, Britain, as you can see. Um, uh, she wor worked in a shop. Uh, she worked as a shop girl, as they would have said in those days, in uh, Corporation Road. What about the third generation of the Cokers? Third generation of the Cokers, first Cokers to ever finish high school and get a tertiary education at, uh, not at university, but the Darlington Teacher Training College. Graduated from Saltburn High School, just outside South Bank, got a tertiary education in the Darlington Teacher Training College. What about the fourth generation of the Cokers? That's me. That's my mother's family. So that's, that's the, that's again what inclusive institutions do in a kind of dynamic way, okay? And the OECD produced some fascinating data on social mobility uh, recently, which is that in Finland it takes three generations to go from the bottom 10% of the income distribution to being middle class, okay? That's kind of what the Cokers, sort of what the Cokers did, okay? It's not so good nowadays in Britain. Uh, but Finland is uh, remarkable in its, uh, the extent of its social mobility. In Colombia, I'm always, my wife is Colombian, you know, so I usually pick on Colombia, and I work a lot in Colombia also. Uh, it takes 11 generations. 11 generations, that's about 200 years to go from being poor to being middle class. Okay, so, so I think this aspect of, you know, talent, kind of unused talent, un, that's mobility, that's a key part of these, these dynamics are a key part of, 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 of inclusive institutions. And so let, let me, before I get into more examples, I just want to sort of kind of dwell on this terminology a bit. So, so, so Professor Asimoglu and I have, we've, we've got a lot of mileage out of this dichotomy between inclusive and extractive institutions. So these dichotomies are very simplistic. There's lots of gray areas. The book, you know, ac academics, you know, we love gray areas and balancing angels on pinheads. And so, so, so if you want nuance, I can do nuance, you know. But I think just for developing the argument, it's very useful to keep these dichotomies in mind. So, 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 so let me kind of just reinforce this terminology and the distinction between inclusive economic institutions. You know, you can think of the patent as being the patent you know, law as being an economic institution. Inclusive economic institutions are those that create broad-based patterns of incentives and opportunities. Okay. And the opposite of that we call extractive economic institutions. So extractive economic institutions in different ways impede incentives and opportunities, or they create incentives and opportunities for a small fraction of people in society, like members of the North Korean Communist Party, for example. Okay, so, so, so this, 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 this inclusive and extractive institutions, but what you've already seen from the Korean case is that this is an outcome of politics. You know, you get the economic institutions you do and you get the patterns of prosperity you get because of the political process. That's where these economic institutions um, come from, okay? And, and one of the emphases of the book, you know, which is the talking about the challenges of democracy and the challenges of inclusive institutions we face in the world today, one of the points is that there's always incentives to create extractive institutions, you know, and it's a long struggle to create an inclusive society. This is one of my favorite examples, you know, uh, in the United States going back, let's go back to, the, to the, the beginning of the last century in the United States. This is an octopus. Okay. If you look at the head, the head of the octopus is a sort of oil barrel, and on the top it says standard oil. Okay. So this is the great kind of oil monopoly of Rockefeller, 
And you can see it, the octopus has got its tentacles around the White House, around Capitol, around everybody. Okay? So Standard Oil Company was trying to buy politicians. It was trying to influence elections. It was trying to control the media. Okay? What happened to the Standard Oil Company? It was broken up under the Sherman Antitrust Act. Okay? Roll on uh, a few decades later, here's Bill Gates. Okay? So Bill Gates, fantastically creative, innovative, driven person. Okay? He had lots of patents. What's he doing here? Swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He and Microsoft were dragged into court in Washington, D.C., and eventually found guilty of violating the Sherman Antitrust Act, the same antitrust act that was used to break up the Standard Oil Company. Okay? So this example I like a lot because in the book we compare, at the time we wrote the book, the two richest people in the world were Bill Gates and Carlos Slim, who was a Mexican entrepreneur. And what's interesting about that is not just their fortune, which is about $45 billion at the time, but how they made their money. Okay? Bill Gates made his money through innovation. Okay? He dropped out of Harvard. He started Microsoft. He innovated. Okay? And when he innovated, he became extremely wealthy, of course, but he sucked all sorts of talent and people into the computer industry. Carlos Slim, how did Carlos Slim make $45 billion? He got his friends in the governing, in the one party state, to privatize to him, unregulated, the telecom monopoly, Telmex. Okay? So the OECD did a calculation of the economic losses associated with Telmex, which was about double Carlos Slim's fortune. So, so while Bill Gates, you know, created more wealth. He, was, he is very wealthy, but he created more wealth than he himself benefited from. Remember my discussion of patents and innovation? Carlos Slim did the opposite. It wasn't just about taking money or income from Mexicans and giving it to Carlos Slim. Carlos Slim's monopoly made everybody poorer in Mexico. Okay? So that's a great example of an extractive institution. It might have created incentives and opportunities for Carlos Slim, but it blocked other people's incentives and opportunities. And that's, that's exactly the thing with extractive institutions. So, so lying behind these extractive and inclusive economic institutions are political institutions. And now I've already sort of hinted at what, how we kind of categorize that. How come in the United States they had this thing called the Sherman Antitrust Act? Okay? That was really the result of popular pressure on, on the government, the so-called populist movement collective mobilization in society that forced the government to respond to this problem of monopolies and, 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 and cartels. And, and so, so that was the democratic context in the United States that forced the government to pass this Sherman Antitrust Act. In Mexico, as I said, there was a one-party state. There was no democracy. They made a deal with Carlos Slim to... Uh, privatized Telmex. Okay, so lying behind inclusive and extractive economic institutions are political institutions. And our main emphasis is, well, if you want to have inclusive economic institutions, you have to have the right sort of political institutions, and we call those inclusive also. Okay, inclusive political institutions. And that's what led to the Sherman Antitrust Act. And it's what led to the enforcement of the Sherman Antitrust Act on the richest person in the world. Now, Mexico actually has fantastic uh, antitrust laws. I know who wrote them. But you could never enforce them on Carlos Slim. It's unimaginable. You can't, the state doesn't have the capacity to enforce them. So that suggests that there's two dimensions to inclusive political institutions. One is political power has to be broadly distributed in society. That's what forced the Sherman Antitrust Act. But the state must have the capacity to enforce the law also. So there's two components. And, in, you know, and, and what I call extractive political institutions usually arise when either of those things or both of those things fail. Either political power is concentrated, like in North Korea, or the state lacks the capacity to enforce the law, which would be true in you know, my example of the Mexican antitrust law. 
So, so this is a bit, this isn't in the book. Uh, we came up with this diagram, uh, and, and the publisher, our publisher nearly had a heart attack when, when we showed it to him. He said, you can't put that in the book. Don't put that, don't put that in the book. Okay, so we didn't put it in the book, but, but, you know, but, it, but it's useful for discussing the ideas. You know? So this is the sort of, this is the book in a nutshell. I, I'll, I'll talk about China in a minute. And the idea is, you know, is to sort of say, down here where North Korea is, that's, that's the part of the world with extractive economic institutions, that's along the top, kind of created by extractive political institutions, and wealthy places, you know, uh, I should have had Finland up there, sorry, uh, places with inclusive, I didn't mention social mobility, are uh, inclusive, inclusive economic institutions in synergy with inclusive uh, um, uh, political institutions, okay? So, 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 let me give you another example of extractive political institutions that I like a lot from my research, okay? So I, this, is, uh, this is in Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe, where I was doing field work in, in 2017, and I'd just been at um, uh, a dinner with some friends, and I was taking a taxi back to the hotel. And, you know, you can see at night, not much electricity in Harare, you know, it's a bit like Pyongyang, um, uh, there's car lights and stuff, but there's no street lights. Okay, so there's a lot of power cuts and problems. So we turned the corner, and something weird happened. You know, I was sitting in the taxi, and I could sense, I couldn't articulate what it was, but something weird was going on. And you can see, what's the difference? Street lights. Suddenly there were street lights. There aren't street lights in Harare. What's going on? So I asked the taxi driver, what's going on in Harare? And he said, ah. This is the road to President Robert Mugabe's residence. So, you know, so there's, that's what happens with extractive political institutions. I don't think you have that in Helsinki. We could check this evening. Okay. Uh, so let me talk a bit more about the rule of law. I've been sort of alluding to the rule of law. And I want to talk about the rule of law, you know, in terms of, you know, for me, one of the most interesting definitions of the rule of law, which is due to the American uh, legal, legal scholar and philosopher Lon Fuller. You know, so here's Jeremy Waldron, who's a very distinguished political theorist, talking about you know, the rule of law. But what's nice about Lon Fuller's description is he tells this parable of King Rex. I don't know if you know this, if you've ever read this parable, but he talks about King Rex. And King Rex has to run his country, and he makes lots of mistakes. And from his, the mistakes he made, Fuller sort of extracts from this principles that govern the rule of law. So his main point is King Rex doesn't manage to run his country well because the rule of law is absent, and he, he identifies these different principles, generality, publicity, prospectivity. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'm just going to give you some examples to show that Exactly the principles that Lon Fuller identifies as key to the rule of law fail in when you have extractive institutions. Okay? So, for example, uh, 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 you know, just to emphasize here something I've been saying, the rule of law is a key component of inclusive institutions, ad hocness versus uh, generality. Okay? Uh, the first desideratum for subjecting human conduct to governance of rules is an obvious one. There must be rules, okay? So recall my example of Bill Gates and Carlos Slim. There have to be, there have to be rules, okay? In Mexico, there aren't rules. You just negotiate with your friends, and if you have power, you get what you want. And so that's, that violates one of Fuller's key principles of the rule of law. Here's another one, uh, talking of Russia. Uh, it's probably going on at the moment with Prigozhin disappearing from air, being airbrushed out of photographs, hanging out with Putin. Uh, this is an older version. Uh, there you see Lenin. There's Lenin up in the bit, bit and then Trotsky, you know, disappears from the photograph on the right. Uh, he's kind of airbrushed out of the picture. Uh, that violates one of you know Fuller's, uh, Fuller's um, desiderata of retroactivity versus prospectivity. Okay. You need to know the rules in advance so you can act on them. You don't kind of make up the rules ex post uh, to, to, to justify the situation, okay? So that's very typical in situations with extractive institutions like in Russia, okay? And here's a good one too. Number eight, this is Fuller's principle number eight, ink back to North Korea, incongruence uh, versus congruence, okay? Uh, 
As the bound volumes of Rex's judgments became available to the citizens uh, and were subjected to closer study, his subjects were appalled to discover that there existed no discernible relation between those judgments and the code they purported to apply. So North Korea made a big thing about banning smoking in public, and here's the president who's always seen with a cigarette in hand. Okay, so he's above the law. The president is above the law. Okay, you can't apply, you know, that was exactly what Leo Michelin was worried about with the Tsar. The Tsar was an absolutist monarch. He was above the law. He needed to be bound by the law. That's one of the key struggles historically in creating inclusive institutions. So I think if you go through Fuller's list of desiderata of the rule of law, you see exactly the connection between extractive institutions and the rule of law. Okay. Now, of course, I'm a little anxious. I'm, I, I'm, I tend to be very anxious that I'm talking too much. So, 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 so somebody should put their hand up, and I don't. I can't see the clock. Here. Oh, I can. No, I can't. I can't see the clock. So, so. Uh? Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, so of course, you know, talking about extractive institutions and inclusive institutions and how they sort of, these politics and economics fits together, that, that, you know, that has this flavor of looking at the kind of deep roots of the divergence of different societies a lot of my research has been about. But there's also transitions, okay? There are transitions. Societies, you know, Britain, historically, didn't have inclusive institutions. It created inclusive institutions. Okay, so, so in Why Nations Fell, we emphasize a lot the sort of the dynamics, also the dynamics of, institution, of, in, of, in, of e these institutions. Yes, of course, it's true that in North Korea, you know, many aspects of the extractive institutions fit together and lead them to persist, okay, like in Zimbabwe. But that doesn't mean that you can't make a transition to more inclusive societies because, because every society that's inclusive today has made such a transition. So we call this like breaking the mold, okay? And how does that breaking the mold happen? Okay, how, does it ha how do you move from extractive to inclusive institutions? And there we emphasize a lot collective action by the people who suffer under extractive institutions. Think of the Rose Revolution, the Orange Revolution, the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, the Arab Spring. Of course, the Arab Spring suggests, okay, <laughs> But it's difficult to make that transition. More or less, that transition, that attempted transition to more inclusive societies in the Middle East at the time of the Arab Spring has failed everywhere. It's now failing in Tunisia, which was the one sort of apparent success story. Why is that? Well, we emphasize in the book, we try to explain that variation by saying it's a particular sort of transition that's important. It's a transition which involves what we call a broad coalition in society. Okay, and let me give you, you know, not just because I'm British, but the British case comes up a lot in the book, but I think the British case illustrates brilliantly this transition, the nature of the broad coalition, and the connection between the rule of law and the broad coalition, which is something that I particularly want to emphasize today. Because in the 17th century, there was a civil war in England in the 1640s, but in 1660, the monarchy was uh, recreated, and in 1685, James II came to the throne. And who was his role model? His role model was Louis XIV. His role model was French absolutism. He wanted to create an absolutist state in Britain. And what he tried to do was manipulate the legal system. Okay? So the law became an enormous point of contention between James II and, uh, and the citizens. He wanted to be above the law. So he started appointing judges uh, who would rule that he was above the law. He wanted to undermine parliament, to pack parliament with his supporters and fill the judiciary with his supporters. Okay? So, uh, so here's you know, Chief Justice George Jeffreys, who's known in British history as the hanging judge. I don't think I need to ex ex exploit, I don't need to explain why he was called the hanging judge. You know, I do a lot of work on Colombian paramilitarisms and at Co Colombian paramilitarism, and I, I spent a lot of time interviewing these paramilitary commanders in Colombia. And when I explain my research, one of the commanders, I, 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 uh, they all have these nicknames. And one of the commanders that I talk about, that I, I, I interviewed, is called, his nickname is Terror. 
So you don't need to explain why someone is called terror. Okay. So you don't need to explain terror or the hanging judge. Okay. He, he was the chief justice of the king's bench, which was very important court in Britain, and he told his successors, execute the law to the utmost of its vengeance upon those that are now known by the name of Whigs. So this is the, the opponents. This was the people who were pushing for constitutional rule. Because our Savior Jesus Christ says in the gospel that they are not, those who are not for us are against us. I'm not sure if that's a really good interpretation of the Bible. But this is not, this is not, the, rule, this is not the rule of law. This is the rule by law, uh, you could say. Okay? And in a famous case, Godden versus Hales, which sort of, in some sense, precipitated what became known as the Glorious Revolution, uh, it's an inseparable prerogative in the kings of England to dispense with penal laws. Okay, so this is just like, you know, the Tsar, James II is above the law. That's part of absolutism. Okay, so, so that's, what the, that's what the contestation was about. Okay, and there's a beautiful book by the great British social historian E.P. Thompson exactly about how this challenge to the rule of law and the notion of the rule of law allowed for the formulation of this broad coalition in Britain against, okay? So the historian, he points out that the fight against James II focused on the law and defending the rule of law against absolutism for the reason I just discussed. And what's fascinating about Thompson's discussion is that this helped kind of cement this broad coalition. What do I mean by that? There, there were many people who opposed James II, you know, aristocrats, merchants, you know, who were worried about their property rights and royal monopolies, you know, ordinary people, you know. So people with very disparate interests and cultures, and, and they had to be brought together into this broad coalition to oppose, um, to oppose James II. And what Thompson points out is that it was inherent in the very nature of the medium which they, aristocrats, merchants, etc., fighting the crown, had selected for their own self-defense, meaning he's violating the rule of law. He's violating the rule of law. We have to stop that, okay? But it was intrinsic in that medium, that's what Thompson says, that, that it could not be reserved for the exclusive use only of their own class. So what does he mean by that? He means once you pick the rule of law as a way of kind of bringing a coalition together against the monarchy, then it's the rule of law. I can't use that selectively to favor myself against you, the, the merchants against the aristocrats. Or, so it, 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 kind of, it was intrinsically key to this, bringing this broad coalition together. Okay? It had to be extended to all sorts and degrees of men. Okay? So I think this is the second main point I want to get across today, if I get rushed in the end, which is you know, the rule of law is not just a key part of inclusive institutions. It's a tool in the transition towards inclusive institutions. In the British case, before the rule of law was really established, the idea of the rule of law brought people together in such a way as it, it kind of facilitated building this coalition that created inclusive institutions. So I think that's a very interesting fact, which is, which is, a, which is actually an argument as to, you know, why emphasize the rule of law so much? Why prioritize the rule of law? Well, here's a reason for prioritizing the rule of law, because it's a tool for changing society. It was in the British case. Now, of course, you know, I had China. Everyone thinks about China when I, you know, China is so big and so impressive. And how does my theory apply to China? Okay. Well, the Chinese case sort of half fits in the sense that Chinese economic development since the late 1970s has been driven by a transition towards much more inclusive economic institutions. So starting with Deng Xiaoping, maybe even before that, sort of spontaneously, the Chinese government kind of dismantled the control of agriculture, they introduced incentives, they created opportunities for people. You've got a huge increase in productivity, starting in the rural sector, uh, with the household responsibility sec moving into the industrial sector in the 1980s. Okay, so, so that's exactly what our theory would say. You make economic institutions more inclusive, you're going to get economic development. But what doesn't fit is the fact that political institutions have stayed very extractive. Okay, so how can you think about that, this sort of odd combination? And our, our 
our view of that is very simple, that you can't have a sustainable, inclusive development at the whim of a dictatorship, okay? And in fact, there's many examples in history of what we call extractive growth in the book. We illustrate that with many examples of kind of transitory experiences of economic growth without this combination of inclusive, inclusive. But they never last, all right? So here's my favorite one, um, going back to the Soviet Union, uh, which, which, which is, you know, when I tell this story to students, they, they, they have no idea what you're, they think you're joking, okay? But, but this, is a, this is a diagram from Paul Samuelson's uh, 1961 edition of his Principles of Economics. This is like probably one of the most famous economics books. Generations of people learn economics from this book. And you can see here, he has a graph of the Soviet Union catching up to the United States in um, the year 2000, all right? So if you go on to successive 1967 version of the book, still catching up in 2000, uh, the 1970 version, uh, he delays it to 2010. As you go on, you get the idea, he delays it to 2020. Then the picture disappears from the book. And it comes back in the next edition, except that China replaces the Soviet Union. Okay? Now, of course, there's many differences between China and the Soviet Union, which are important, and we could discuss that. But I think the point of this is that the, Soviet, the economic growth in the Soviet Union from the mid-1920s, probably until the middle of the 1970s, fooled everybody. It fooled you know, the world's greatest economist. It fooled the CIA. It fooled Khrushchev and the Soviet Union's own leadership. You know, we will bury you, Khrushchev said. Okay? Now you tell that to students, they think it's a sort of joke. You know, like nobody can remember this, okay? But, but so it's good to kind of reflect on that and think, how wrong can we be about these experiences, okay? So, you know, whoop. so, you know, I try to take the long view. Why is it transitory, okay? And my view is very simple about why it's transitory. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, okay? So, so at least, you know, uh, that's my view, okay? So here's President Xi. A presidency, you know, who's now consolidating a personalistic dictatorship in China. Okay, so remember how I said China flourished in the 1970s. Okay, it flourished because the Communist Party stopped trying to control every aspect of people's lives. But the Communist Party still wants to control every aspect of people's lives. Okay, it still wants to do it. It thinks that it can do it with modern technology in a way which will combine totalitarianism with economic growth. But I don't believe that's possible. I don't think human history suggests that's possible. Okay? Now, some people, you know, say, some people say when you talk about China, oh, yeah, but China is different. You know, China is different. It's a kind of anomaly. It's sort of, you know, why could it be anomalous? Well, Chinese people respect merit. You know, if you go back and you read Confucius's Analects, Confucius says, promote those who are worthy and talented. Okay, fine, you know. Here's an example of talent and merit, okay? Jack Ma criticizes the regulatory framework. He disappeared. He's basically disappeared now. He's disappeared. He disappeared for three months. He's disappeared completely, okay? You can't have a modern, innovative economy, inclusive economy in a totalitarian political system like this. That's, that's my view, okay? So Chinese growth will collapse and it will go off the rails I don't know how, it'll be pretty scary and it'll be far more tectonic uh, for the world economy than the invasion of Ukraine, but it will happen. Uh, and, and, you know, and we should prepare for that. All right, um, I should shut up, I want to shut up. Okay, so, so let, me, let me shut up. Okay, so, so and I just, and I wanna emphasize, come back to, to these, que these issues of the rule of law, okay? So prosperity requires innovation, entrepreneurship, for this you need inclusion. It was great to hear people talking about that, okay? That's the lesson of my research and building on the research of many other people, okay? That's not a technical exercise. You know, one of the things that I find most frustrating with economics and one of the reasons I abandoned the economics profession and became a political scientist is that that is not a technical problem. It's not a technical problem solving the development problems of Zimbabwe or Congo. It's a political problem. It's a problem of building institutions and developing the political project behind building those institutions. And what I've tried to illustrate here is that the rule of law is a key part of those inclusive institutions. But it's more than that. 
It's more than that. It's also a tool for building inclusive institutions. That's what the British experience suggests and many other experiences suggest. And that's why you know, I congratulate you on your initiative here on this focus on the rule of law and just why it's so important for, for, for the world. Thank you. So good morning. Good morning, everyone here uh, at the hall and also following online. We have now reserved approximately 15 minutes for questions for Mr. Robinson. You're welcome to present them also online to the chat. Uh, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Uh, we'll collect approximately two to three questions first for Mr. Robinson. And please introduce yourself before the question. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for your very interesting lecture. I'm Nina Maisorze. I'm exchange student in the University of Helsinki. I'm originally from Georgia, and you know that my country's territories are occupied by Russia. And I think that we have Finland and also Georgia have so much in common. Uh, for example, we have a common enemy, uh, if we can. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. And I was born and raised near to so-called borderline, and it's really difficult for me. And my question is about, for example, we know that uh, Estonia, Latvia, Litva, and other countries uh, are former Soviet Union countries, and also with Georgia. And uh, can you explain to me, uh, for example, the main principles why these countries are now developed and, for example, other countries are not. Because I really worried about my country, because I think that everyone worries about uh, their country. So uh, can you explain the main points why uh, Baltic countries is developed and other countries are not? So that would be really interesting uh, to hear from you. Thank you very much in advance. Okay. Thank you. So let's collect another question okay. and in the meanwhile. Right. Any raised hands? And in the meanwhile, I'll read one question from the online chat. So there's a question about service pro providers such as Facebook, Google, and Amazon. Uh, their operations are quite far from being inclusive institutions. And is there any possible to, uh, possibility to challenge companies such as these? Okay. And then one question from the audience. Yes, hello. I'm from Demo Finland, uh, an organization for political parties to strengthen democracy. My name is Rosa Kaimio, and uh, I'm wondering, uh, you have used Finland as a positive example of an inclusive society, and in Finnish contexts, we have for a decade now or so uh, been really slow on economic growth, and the current government is suggesting that the social welfare state it has gone too broad, it's supporting its citizens too much. So... What are your explanations for the fact that despite being inclusive society where it's possible to raise to the middle class, Finland struggles with economic growth and the solution always seems to be cut down the social welfare state? Okay, so, so let me just take them in the order they came. I mean, I, you know, I, think, I think if you look at you know, these, these, these Eastern Europe and the former Soviet countries, you know, you see, what's the difference with the Baltic states? Well, first of all, the Soviet Union, you know, and Russian influence collapsed completely in 1990. So they had a breathing space, you know, to reorganize their societies. I think, you know, they were able to tap into histories of inclusion, you know, before the Second World War, for example, and to kind of very distinct identities that allowed them to kind of develop a collective project to build a more inclusive society. And also, the European Union had a fantastically positive effect, meaning that created collective incentives to change institutions and harmonize with Europe. But that moment has sort of gone now. You know, that was a moment in the 1990s which had kind of, where many things kind of coalesced, it seems to me. I'm not an expert on that part of the world, but, 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 but many things coalesced to sort of facilitate that. It didn't determine it, of course. It didn't determine that such a society was created. Uh, 
But it, it allowed it, it encouraged it. And I think, you know, Armenia is in, is in a very different space. You know, now Russia has kind of reorganized itself in this totalitarian way. Uh, and it's able to exert influence much more effectively than it was in the 1990s when it was kind of, kind of fractured and contested within. And so that same space isn't, 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 there, isn't there now. You know, it was a moment of history. So, I, you know, that would be my thinking about it. Um, uh, uh, uh. I mean, I think Google and Amazon, you know, I think that, um, you know, fundamentally, the people who run those companies, you know, they're so wealthy because they're producing something that people want, you know, at the end of the day. This is not like Carlos Slim. It's not like, you know, if you want a telephone, you have to get it from Carlos Slim. Okay, I think, I think, I think, so for me, it still represents kind of innovation and creativity. Yes, it's a monopoly. You know, it's a monopoly because there's many, you know, what economists would say, network externalities. You know, there's a sort of element of natural monopoly here. It's extremely difficult to enter and contest the market with Amazon because there's such enormous increasing returns to scale. So it's, it's, a, it's a natural monopoly in some sense, like in what you say in public finance, it's a natural monopoly. So what, are you, what do you do with natural monopolies? You have to regulate them. You have to regulate them, otherwise they start charging too much. And so I think that's an issue of, I don't, so I don't see that as kind of fundamentally contradictory to, of course there's lots of problems with inclusive institutions in the United States. You know, there's massive problems of discrimination and marginalization, especially of black people, you know, and so that, and there's huge history of discrimination in the United States. You know, I put up the civil rights movement there. You know, we have massive attacks, you know, from the Republican Party and Donald Trump on the, our institutions, you know, and, 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 and the, the rule of law. And all, you know, so, so there's many challenges. So I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to say there aren't challenges. There are, but I think, I think there's a way of thinking about those problems which, which, which you, know, it, it, you know, is consistent with maintaining inclusion, but nevertheless, they have, to be, they have to be regulated, and just like Microsoft was, showing Bill Gates, to, to act in, in the collective interest. So whether that can be done effectively, of course, is another issue, but there's certainly a lot of thought going into that at the moment. I mean, in, you know, in terms of... Finland, I, you know, Finland is an is a, is a economically very successful country. You know, once you're at the, what economists would call the world technology frontier, you're bound to grow slowly economically relative to you know, South Korea or countries that have been poor that are able to grow very rapidly by borrowing technologies and doing kind of basic things in terms of investing in education and infrastructure. So, so I think, I think um, you know, and when you get to the frontier, there's, there's trade-offs, you know, like in my own, in England, you know, I grew up in England, you know, in the, in the period of Mrs. Thatcher, you know, where there's trade-offs, you know, there's trade-offs between redistribution and creating more incentives. And, and, you know, we can debate about the evidence on, you know, how distortionary taxes are and, you know, how social insurance can encourage economic development or it can discourage economic development and, you know, but I think, I think, you know, if you look across what I would call, you know, inclusive societies, you see there's a lot of scope for experimenting. You know, the United States or Britain is very different from Scandinavia. Uh, and, you know, I guess my perspective is, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert on that either, but it just seems like you know, I guess I, I always have difficulty talking about those problems because, you know, I work mostly in the developing world and that, you know, when, <laughs> compared to the challenges that you have in a country like Nigeria or Congo, obviously, you know, the problems in Finland are, you know, much smaller <laughs> without diminishing, you know, how serious the issues are. Um, but, but I, you know, I do, I do think there are, there are trade-offs. You know, I think, you know, if, if I thought about, say, Britain and Mrs. Thatcher, you know, I think what Mrs. Thatcher did did in some ways create you know, more economic prosperity in Britain, but it also created massive inequality. You know? So, so there's, a, there's a big thing to think about in, in British society also. So I think even inclusive societies, they still have important decisions to make in terms of you know, what kind of society do people want to live in. Thank you. We have time for two more questions from the audience. Gentlemen at the back. Hello. 
Yeah, I'm Biso from Nepal, South Asia. So my question is that you have done a wonderful study, a comparative study, and I was really amazed to uh, attend your lecture actually. Uh, so <clears throat> we share some, uh, the common problem of de developing countries, like we are having the intensive political instability in Nepal, and then I was wondering that when we are talking about this inclusive, um, establishing in inclusive institution to have, to accelerate uh, the economic growth and prosperity. <clears throat> so my question is that, do you have any idea to how to, how to still accelerate and promote uh, the rule of law uh, and um, uh, when you have this uh, very immature, uh, let's say, the unstable political uh, governing systems, and uh, that that has posed a real challenge to uh, to establish the political, uh, you know, inclusive political institution. The first one is, and another is that we have, in terms of uh, this um, uh, inclusive society. Uh, uh, so we have had this positive discrimination to bring uh, the, to maintain the balance between uh, so two class like uh, the privileged and less privileged people. So, but we are we are facing serious challenge now. I can at least say that India and Nepal. Uh, so uh, when we practice this uh, uh, the positive discrimination, like we call reservation or quota systems, to maintain the balance or to prove. Um, uh, let's say, um, to empower the less privileged people uh, to, to be in decision-making process. Uh, so, but we have been facing the serious challenge in terms of establishing the, and um, uh, this inclusive po political institution, um, uh, and we are having this incompetent uh, human resources so, resources. so, how do you combat that balance still and promote the rule of law? Uh, being best in, having in, in background of these uh, problems. Thank you. Thank you. Then one final question from Kim Manuatio over there. Yes, my name is Kim Manuatio. I'm a professor of, of law at the law faculty here. We've been reading your work with great interest and also now listening to your, your great speech. And I just wanted to ask you something about, because I get the impression that we're actually we're just like getting in there, starting to see really the relevance of the principles of rule of law, like, you know, for the development, because it's kind of a paradoxical that rule of law is sort of a, it's a non-tool, basically. It's a, it's a way of operating a country, a state, and, and, and creating the possibilities for, for everything. But then it's actually, it is also a tool for changing the society, as you indicate. So is it something that we are like, we're just now starting to see like, you know, the theoretical value and that we should really be engaging in like interdisciplinary work on the relevance of the rule of law. And, and that would also maybe give a little bit of new energies to promote the development uh, by using really the sort of rule of law tools for that. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, lots of questions. You know, um, I'm not an expert on Nepal, um, but you know, on the issue of um, quotas, for example, or kind of mandated representation, I think I think the evidence on that is rather interesting. You know, there's very good work in India, for example, like Rohini Pandey, um, who's an Indian scholar at Yale University, uh, looked at the impacts of mandated representation of women. Uh, so, so, you know, so, so making sure that there's specific positions, political positions for women. And what she showed is that this has a very positive effect of breaking down stereotypes. Uh, you know, men have stereotypes about women as leaders, maybe not in Finland, but in India. And what, you ha what happens when you, 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 put a, you, create a, you put a woman leader is men realize, oh, women, that they're actually good at this, you know? And so what she documented is significant changes, reduction in stereotypes and improvements in attitude towards women as leaders and improvements in the... So, so I think there can be important role for these mandated positions to kind of break 
particular equilibria. So I don't know, you know, what the evidence is on these caste representations and stuff that they also have in India. Uh, but I think there's a lot of evidence that that can actually be a powerful tool. Uh, and, you know, the same is true with affirmative action in, in, in the United States. You know, it kind of breaks down people's stereotypes and, and, and people, you know, segregate, especially in the United States. You know, you get so much segregation of these different communities that allows stereotypes to appear. So you need to break that. And so I think that can be a useful tool. That's what the evidence, um, the evidence suggests. I think on, you know, on, on, the, on the, yeah, the, I, you know, the rule of law as a tool for, I think rights also, this notion of like rights is very powerful for kind of empowering people and getting people to act sort of collectively, bringing people together around a collective project. You know, I think that's, that's the biggest problem. Like earlier in the year, a very good friend of mine um, was the um, Minister of Finance in the Democratic a transition government in Sudan, which was then overthrown by the military. And just before the civil war started, uh, I was in Sudan in, in Khartoum in January, giving lectures and meeting with lots of different people and trying to talk about the problems they had. And you know, there you see what happened after the dictatorship was overthrown, after, uh, after President al-Bashir was thrown out of power, was there was a, a very broad coalition of people in Khartoum. It was an amazing thing, civil society, lawyers spearheaded by, you know, uh, lawyers, in, by the way. Uh, and, but as soon as the, the dictator was gone, everybody fell out. Into, there were communists, there were, there were Islamicists, there were followers of the Mahdi, you know, that, like there was, what brought them together? What brought them together was opposition to the dictatorship. But after the dictatorship was over, they fell apart. And you see that many, many, many times in these, transitional instances, you know, so, so, so that's, you need something to bring people together. And I think the rule of law is something that can bring people together by its very nature, as E.P. Thompson kind of pointed out, you know. So, so I think it's underappreciated in that context. And, and I mean, I probably hadn't really thought enough about that until I had to make this lecture up. So I agree with your, your impulse, yes. Thank you so much, Professor Robinson. Please give a warm welcome.